Hello class, this is chapter 10, and this chapter will go over operations management. These are the learning outcomes for chapter 10. Please read through these questions carefully and review the PowerPoint slides and the textbook and the chapter outlines related to operations management. Let's start with this exhibit the production processes for products and service. So what exactly is the definition of inputs, right? And what is the definition of outputs? Okay. So inputs are the resources that you put into the production, such as labor. So there's human needs to either create that product, plus you need capital, right, money, you need raw materials to make a product, such as if you're making, if you're a manufacturing business and you're making 7-Up, right? You're gonna need some materials to make that 7-Up. And you need the natural resources related to making that 7-Up, right? And then once you go through the process of making that product, you have the outputs, right? The outputs is the final product of that 7-Up that's going, go, going to go out to the stores and into the market. In the service industry, the resources that you utilize and the capital that you have to give services to uh, a consumer, an individual. Example, real estate. Real estate is a service that real estate agents provide in terms of helping a client either sell their home or help a buyer buy a home. What does that take? That takes a lot of their resources and time to provide their expertise and knowledge to provide that real estate service. Okay. So let's review that. Uh, let's review that um, slide real quick. And before I move on, I want to tell you the information of what exactly is operations management and what does the term production mean? Operation management is really just a production process. How do you produce a product or how do you deliver a service? What goes into that um, industry, right? Okay, moving on. Here are some concept checks related to section one in the question of why is production and operations management important to both manufacturing and service. Uh, these concept checks are very important in order to address this question of why, produ why is production and operations management important to both the manufacturing and service oriented firms. This exhibit gives you a good classification of the product types into mass production versus mass customization versus customization, right? Take a look at these definitions and examples. And then this is a good chart related to converting the inputs into outputs, right? Basically, the inputs are the raw materials, the human labor that goes into producing an output of either a product or service. And high school is a very good example. High school and college. What are some of the inputs related to the output? The output is really the students that either have graduated from their institution, right? or the public service to educate. And what goes into the system of education, such as high school or college, right? We, we need faculty to teach the classrooms. We need the classrooms and buildings, right? Without the buildings, we don't have classrooms. We need a library that offers the resources such as Wi-Fi and internet connections and computer labs, right? And it, it's, not, it's not producing a, a physical product per se, but it's providing a service to educate the public and also you, the students who have successfully completed the course and moved on to graduation, 
and you know from here at Los Angeles Valley College, you may transfer to a four-year university, whether that be a Cal State University or a University of California, like a UC system such as UCLA, maybe even a private school, USC, Pepperdine, once you completed your education here. And section two asks the question, what types of production process do manufacturers and service firms use? Right. Based on this question and the concept checks, remember to the book go over, go over these questions. And once you take a look at the answer to this, I want you to think about what your process would be in your own business that you decide to create, whether that would be a manufacturing type business or a service oriented type business. Now, here's a video that I want to show you on the next slide related to Harley Davidson and the factory. And this is a pretty interesting case study. And let's take a look at this. Harley Davidson has completely transformed our entire touring experience once again. And today, we're going to take you on a different kind of tour behind the scenes of our Milwaukee area plant. Here, nearly a thousand employees have been working hard to produce an all new engine, the Milwaukee 8, from the ground up. This responsive engine will power all of our 2017 Touring and Trike models. Today is the first time we're opening our doors on a day of a model year launch to take you, our fans, behind the scenes. We'll show you how our engines are built and we'll take you further than we've taken anyone behind the scenes since our 110th anniversary. Why? Today we unveiled the Milwaukee 8, the ninth big twin engine in Harley Davidson history. It's a brand new design that improves on every aspect of touring engine performance. And now we'll show you how it's made right here, right now. Hello, Facebook fans. I'm Jared Olson, the assembly engineering lead here at Harley Davidson. I've enjoyed working here for eight years and over the last 15 months, I've had the pleasure of transitioning our assembly operations to manufacture this all new engine. Today, I'll show you how we've transformed our entire touring experience once again. We're live from our Pilgrim Road engine plant right behind me, just north of our headquarters in Milwaukee. First, I'm sure you'd like to know why we call our new engine the Milwaukee 8. Well, it's simple. As you see, it's built right here in Milwaukee, and it has eight valves in the cylinder heads. And those valves are key to creating the power of this all-new engine. I'll tell you from experience, you got to get one of these bikes and feel the difference for yourself. And we're gonna give you guys a close up look at one of the new bikes in just a bit. So stick around. But first, I'd like you to meet Mike Merrill, the project manager for the manufacturing side of the Milwaukee 8. He's here today to tell you a little bit more about this new engine and answer any questions you have. How's it going, Mike? It's going great, Jared. I'm really proud to be here today and I'm glad that you're joining us live. I'm really excited to show you the inside of the plant I call home most of the week. We've had it buttoned up for a while. We even shortened plant tours for a while to keep everything under wraps. We're excited factory tours and steel toe tours are open again. We love seeing customers like you from around the world who are so excited about the pr products we manufacture every day. Absolutely, Mike. We're usually pretty top secret around here. It's awesome to open our doors to everyone out in Facebook land. So tell them, what are you doing, Harley? Well, I'm the project manager for the Milwaukee 8, and I've been working with this new product transition for hundreds, with hundreds of dedicated employees for the past 15 months to perfect how we manufacture this piece of Milwaukee made machinery. Wow, so how long have you been an employee here? I've been an employee with the motor company for over 20 years. And I can tell you from experience, this is the most proudest moment I've had in my career here. I've seen uh, some launches in the past and this one has topped them all. So I'm very proud that you know I'm part of this experience today. Great. You've been riding too, right? You ride. Oh, yeah. I've ridden a long time. I love the product. I'm really excited to get on top of this one. Great. i also been a rider for about 10 years. What about all you watching us live? What's your favorite ride? Post in the comments below, and our social media team will give you some likes. So, Mike, tell everyone what we're going to show in the next 15 minutes. Sure thing. Today, we're giving an exclusive behind-the-scenes look at what Jared, myself, and 100 hundreds of other smart, passionate people can produce at our Pilgrim Road factory. Right. We want all of you and everyone around the world to see what a world-class lean manufacturing facility looks like. 
and the look of this place has changed a lot in order to build the Milwaukee 8. We've made significant investment in the equipment. We've added, replaced, or retooled over 500 machines here. Really, so can you give a couple examples of some of the equipment that we brought in? Sure, well, one of the examples is in cylinder head machining. Um, it represents our largest investment in this new process. We brought in over 25 new pieces of equipment in order to make the new Milwaukee 8 engine. Wow, that's incredible. And Mike's right. We're sending our cameras inside the plant to give you an exclusive behind the scenes look at what it takes to put this Milwaukee 8 together. You'll see how our all new touring bike offers a more powerful, more responsive, more comfortable, and more refined way to ride. After that, we'll show off our new engine in a 2017 Street Glide Special. But the only way to truly understand this power and responsiveness of the Milwaukee 8 is to visit your local dealership. Bikes start arriving at U.S. dealerships today and over the next few weeks. Also, all the 27 motorcycle details are now up on harley-davidson.com, so please visit that as well. So let the cameras be your eyes, fire away with questions, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Well, let's stop teasing. Let's get right to it. First stop on our tour is powder coating. This is our first major step in manufacturing the Milwaukee 8 engine. That's right, Jared. Most of the aluminum parts you see on your bike receive a special powder coating finish here at our Pilgrim Road Engines plant. Let me tell you more about powder coating. It's an environmentally friendly finishing process that replaces wet paint with a durable special powder cured with high heat. To help you feel what it's like to be powder coated, we've got a GoPro getting full powder coat treatment. Here you see in the picture, we've got several of our parts traveling through our powder coat facility. You see crankcase halves, uh, that are hung on precision hooks, which present the parts to the paint guns. We have a vision system that identifies the parts as they come into the booth and make sure that the uh, paint guns that are gonna be painting the product have the correct program and are reaching all of those areas of the parts. We're actually inside one of the paint booths right now. We've got a combination of static guns or fixed mounted guns that spray powder, as well as robotically controlled arms. Here you can see the robots moving around the parts, making sure they've got powder applied to all the correct areas. We use an electrostatic process. The powder clings to the parts, and then we uh, have the parts go through a couple of ovens where they um, are cured over time. You see a few more of our uh, pictures here with uh, paint robots in motion. Parts will be moving through this process and then up through our heat. It takes about two and a half hours to go through this process. Here you see some of our transmission cases that have been uh, powder coated and they're on their way up to the heat treat. Wow, great job, Mike. And since we're headed to machining, let's take an inside look at cylinder heads. As I mentioned earlier, the Milwaukee 8 name pays tribute to the four valves on each cylinder head. We moved from two valves per cylinder head on the twin cam engine to four valves per head on the new Milwaukee 8 to increase the airflow and to give you more power. Mike, can you walk us through the machining process here as well? Absolutely, I'd be proud to do so. Here's a close up view of our cylinder head machining, our single largest area of investment to support our new engine. In this area, we machine cylinder heads complete from the painted casting level all the way through to the finished part level, ready for subassembly. Robots play a key role by tending our machines. We automatically load and unload parts into the various processes. Heads machining is a three-step process. We have uh, machining of the aluminum casting. We press the seats and guides in for the valves, and then we machine those steel seats and guides. The final process, which you're watching right now, is a robot tended parts washer. We wash the parts, and then we leak test all the parts to make sure that the features, features that we've machined in are in the correct uh, placement. If you're just tuning in, we're here at our Pilgrim Road engine plant where we've opened our doors to show you our brand new Milwaukee 8 engine and show you how it's made. Now let's shift our attention over to another area that I enjoy, crankcases. And the man who knows all about this area is Pierre McDowell. Thanks for joining us and Facebook fans for joining us on Facebook Live. Pierre, what's going on? How are you hey. doing today? Hey, how's it going, Jared? Good to see you. Why don't you tell uh, the fans that are watching a little bit about crankcases and what you do at Harley, a little bit about your family as well. Well, I've been at Harley Davidson for over 20 years. I'm a second generation employee. My dad worked here for 36 years, and I currently have a brother who's been here 22 years, two nephews and a cousin. 
That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about crankcases and what you do in that area as well. Well, like Mike said, it's been a project process for over 15 months. And thanks to my good project team, we got the crankcase area off and running. Awesome. Great. So the crankcase supports the flywheel assembly and cylinder heads. So I'm going to have Pierre walk you through a little bit of what's going on on the, on the video here. Currently, we're looking at the robot as it's loading up a crankcase half, a right half and a left half. It's going to take the part to the pallet that's empty and load it to one of our 12 machining cell centers. After it's loaded and on its way to one of our centers, it's going to machine the part when the cube becomes empty. This process will take place majority of the day. And when the pallet is empty, the, the robot will go down and get machined. Once the dunnage is empty, it will go to the empty lane and start the process all over again. Thanks, Pierre. Each step in the Milwaukee 8 engine assembly process was designed to ensure the highest quality product for our customers. After parts are machined, they tra travel to assembly, which is the show. And what's pretty impressive about our Pilgrim Road engine plant is that we have the tremendous flexibility we can produce every U.S. and international configuration of the Milwaukee 8 engine on either of the assembly lines. Twin cam and Sportster engines are made right alongside all our, our all new Milwaukee 8 engines as well. We have two main assembly lines, each with 21 stations that run parallel to one another and perform the same functions. We also have six finishing stations that put the dress colors on. So either assembly line can build any of the 42 different versions of the Milwaukee 8, Twin cam, or Sportster engines. And here with me now is Sue Casper, another one of the team leaders who will show you one of the many stations that are a key part of our assembly process. Hi, Sue. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, Jerry. Sure. I've been here about 19 years. Uh, my uncle started in 72. Uh, he came here right out of the Vietnam War. And uh, when he said there was an opening 19 years ago, my aunt, my cousins, and I decided to join in. Well, I had a Harley already for a year at that point, and I thought what a great opportunity to actually work somewhere where I'm building the bike that I'm riding. So let's tell, talk to me a little bit about that first Harley you had. What was sure, it? Sure, I had a 1200 custom purple bike. It was very pretty, yeah. and it was a great ride. How many uh, bikes have you had? I've had five. Five bikes. And every bike got better, and I every time I get, felt a little more comfortable, I got a little bigger bike, and that is why I cannot wait to try out this new Milwaukee 8. I haven't tried it yet. Looking like I'm going out to the dealers today, and then I'm going to see. So what I really want to do is I want to really try the trike. So I'm looking at going out there. Awesome. Trying to the trike out. Great. So why don't you tell some of our fans about this station uh, in the cylinder area? Sure. So at this station, the cylinders are being installed on the all-new Milwaukee 8 engine. We use precise tools and a high-tech precise camera system to make sure the right part is placed exactly in this proper space. Our 100. Our hundreds of highly skilled operators completed more than 12,000 hours of training to prepare for the launch of the all-new Milwaukee 8 engine. And right now, what you're seeing is you're, you're seeing the motors coming through, the engines coming down the line. Um, as you can see, we're showing up. We have a mix of engines because we're, we got it so we can do the sports series, we can do the Milwaukee 8. So they're getting ready to do the final cylinder assembly from the assembly line. What's happening right now is what I really honestly feel this is the heart of the motorcycle. So this is the end product of the R assembly part. So we're putting the cylinder head on, and we're all good. Thank you very much, Sue. If you're just tuning in, we're here at Pilgrim Road Engine Plant, where we've opened our doors to showcase our brand new Milwaukee 8 engine and how it's made. And with the new engine, there are plenty of questions rolling in. So let's take a moment to answer one of your questions. First one up is we have John D. from Wausau, Wisconsin. Which 2017 models is the Milwaukee 8 engine available in? That's a great question, John. So basically the Milwaukee 8 engine is in all of our 2017 touring uh, bikes. No matter what you got, a street glide, a trike, it's gonna be in all of the touring platform bikes. I'm gonna take another question here. So we have, uh, let's see, Russell B asks, why is it called the Milwaukee 8? That's another great question. So thanks for the question, Russell. The, the name pays homage to the eight valve design and the Milwaukee, our hometown from the 113 years, our mecca of motorcycles. Great. So thanks again for your great questions. I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Absolutely. Thanks for your great questions and keep them coming. So I want to know, is everyone ready to see the completed engines? We're going to show you one of the last steps of the production processes right now. Great. So after traveling through each assembly station, every engine is cold tested and checked more than 
200 features. These checks ensure each Milwaukee 8 and every engine we produce is ready for you, our customers. I bet not all of our fans know that cold testing is a safe and sustainable process for us. There's no gas in the engine, which helps us save more than 13,000 gallons of gas and 130 tons of CO2 emissions each year. By the way, every engine we build goes through this process before we ship it. As you can see here, this is it. This is the jewel right behind you on the screen. That's the Milwaukee 8 powertrain. They're staged in our sequence lanes and we are ready to pull them off of the sequence lanes and be adding them into the shipping racks, which you see here. The shipping racks then go directly to our docks. We have the docks located right at the end of the assembly line. From this point, they will travel all the way over to York, Pennsylvania, our final vehicle assembly plant. Great, thanks again, Mike. We specifically engineered the all new Milwaukee 8 engine to meet regulatory standards across the globe without compromising the authentic look, sound and feel that we all love for years. So I think I've been keeping everybody waiting long enough. Let's see the bike. Wow, this bike looks great, JJ. This is a model year 2017 bike. It's a street glide special. And we have JJ Braun from our events team here. Good to meet you, JJ. Yeah, you too, Jared. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah. So I've been about this company for about 10 years. I currently work in marketing. Uh, me and my team are focused right now on getting butts on bikes and helping people That's live awesome. their dream and get on a Harley Davidson. Great. So can you tell me some, uh, some details about this bike that the customers are gonna really appreciate? Yeah, you bet. This is a 2017 Street Glide Special. It boasts the all new Milwaukee 8 engine. Yeah. And I can tell you, Jared, the increased torque and acceleration on this new engine makes this a fun and exciting bike to ride. I'm excited. But that's not the only thing new that we got on these bikes. We've got a slimmer primary over here that helps us make sure that our consumers can put their feet flat on the ground. We also have a brand new suspension, front and rear on this platform. Awesome. One of my favorite features about this too is you can adjust the suspension with just a twist of a wrist. All you need to do, take out the left-hand saddlebag, you can dial up and dial down that suspension so you can get that optimal ride. Awesome, great. There's also some great rider-centric features on here. We got reflex link ABS braking for optimal stopping power. We got the slipstream vent here in the front. Okay. This helps us to reduce head buffeting when you're going down the road. This bike also has one touch design built into everything so you can operate everything with almost the touch of a finger. You can open your saddlebag, fuel cap, et cetera. Great. All with a touch of a finger. It also has tons of technology. This particular model has a 6.5 inch touch screen with built in Bluetooth and GPS. Great. Tell me about the displacement of this bike. I'm kind of wanting to know what the, what our factory options are here for this. Yeah. Well, this bike here, uh, the rest of our touring line comes in a 107 or our CDO line comes in a uh, factory 114. That's what I'm going to get. 114. That's I'm going to go to my local dealership tonight to get it on order. Well, if you want a little bit of extra power too, we offer a ton of screaming eagle performance parts to give your engine that extra kick that you're looking for. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks a lot, JJ. Yeah, you're welcome. So thanks again, Facebook fans, for tuning in. If you want any more questions answered or details on this bike, check out harley-davidson.com for more videos, images, and product details. And don't forget to take a free Discover More test ride at your local Harley-Davidson dealership so you can feel the difference for yourself. Here's a look at our new model year 2017 bikes on the road. Your ride is more than just miles. And more is exactly what you'll discover with the 2017 Touring Bikes from Harley Davidson. Two cylinders, eight valves, and power that will unleash your soul. The all new Milwaukee 8 engine. Paired with a new suspension that delivers more comfort and control on every ride. What does uncompromised freedom feel like? Why don't you find out for yourself? Okay, so let's go over some terminology. So what is production planning? Production planning is the aspect of the operations and management, which a company would consider uh, what their competitive environment is and what strategic goals and efforts that they would use to meet those production goals. And a production process is just a way of providing or creating 
that goods or services that one organization or business would give. And mass production is a manufacturer term where all the goods that you produce is the same. And then mass customization, this is where the goods are produced massively, but to a point and then custom tailored based on the needs and desires of the consumers that they try to reach. And customization is just the production of goods or the services that is specific to each individual customer. Make sure you check out your textbook and in chapter 10 and read the chapter outlines, review the vocabulary. This one here is the type of facility layout. And the facility layout is very important in terms of how you work your process in producing your goods, your product, right? Um, for example, when you, when you go to a Quiznos sub sandwich place or a Subway or some sort of sandwich shop, there's some special layouts that is needed to work in that area to produce that product of sandwiches, right? And there's a method of how the sandwiches are made and where the lettuce is, where the, uh, where the meats are and where the oven is. It's, it's all specifically laid out in order to produce the overall product of output, which is that sandwich that you as the customer had paid for. Um, think about the restaurants, right? They're laid out in a certain way, you know, to catch, to, to make it ease and access for the customers, right? Location of your facility is also important in terms of if you're offering a service. The reason why I say that is because if you own a beautiful business, but there's lack of parking, you know, then people not might have a lot of foot traffic, right? That's just something to consider as well. Section three is how do organizations decide whether to put their production facilities? What choices must be made in designing the facility? And these are some concept check questions while reviewing this section of chapter 10. Section four, why are resource planning tasks such as inventory management and supplier relations critical to the production? And these are two concept check questions to consider when reading in chapter 10, this section. And here's a, a link to a, a video on YouTube, supply chain management. Let's take a look at this video on supply chain management. Welcome to Supply Chain Management. Now, I know most of you spent your childhood evenings dreaming of taking your first supply chain management course. But for those handful of you who might not know what supply chain management is, let me provide you a brief explanation. Let's take a simple product, like a bottle of water. Clean water, a plastic bottle, a plastic cap, and a label. Buying them at the store or vending machine might cost you about $1.50. How much of that do you think is profit? Nope, wrong, wrong again, not likely. Water, a plastic bottle and a label. That couldn't cost more than 50 cents. And if you buy them in bulk, how could each bottle not give you at least a dollar in profit? Seriously, if you think you can make $1 per bottle, you should drop out of college right now and get into the bottled water business. You see, this right here illustrates one of the most common consumer misconceptions. Product cost is not equal to material cost. And in business, you don't have the luxury of thinking only as a consumer. You need to think like a business executive or better yet, an entrepreneur. So in order to figure out where all that profit went, we need to imagine what it took for that bottle of water to get into your hands. First, you need to negotiate the purchase of the empty bottles and caps. Those bottles will be much easier to transport if they're in boxes. We need to shrink wrap those bottles so they don't fall out of the box. We can move a whole lot of boxes quickly if they're all put on pallets. In order to move the pallets, you'll need a forklift, which means you'll need a forklift driver. That forklift will then take the pallet and put it into a truck, which will require a truck, driver, fuel, and insurance. 
also you'll need a label for that bottle of water. Therefore, you need to design the label, print the label, and get the label shipped to the plant. Another truck, driver, more fuel, and insurance. A water bottling plant won't be free, and neither will the energy it uses. In our bottling plant, we'll have employees and bottling machines, and let's not forget the day-to-day -day items like light bulbs, garbage bags, machine parts, janitorial supplies, toilet paper, and anything else that would be used at the plant by the employees. Oh yeah, we will also need access to the drinking water. Machines will then purify the water. Other machines will bottle the water and affix the labels to the bottles. And still, another set of machines will box, shrink wrap, and then palletize the bottles. In order to move those pallets, again, you'll need a forklift, which means we'll need another forklift driver. That forklift will then take the pallets and put them into trucks headed to the distribution centers. And as we've seen, those trucks will require drivers, fuel, and insurance. Those distribution centers will also require employees, forklifts, and energy. From the distribution center, they'll head out to retail stores on still another truck which will require a driver, fuel, and insurance. That store will need employees to unload the truck, stock the bottles of water on the shelf or refrigerator. If you have a refrigerator, you'll of course need energy. If we want to secure our stock, we may get a security guard or a security system. And of course, the store will likely get insurance. Also, imagine the costs associated with returning and replacing bottles that are damaged. Oh. And for some reason, even bottles of water sometimes have 1-800 numbers, which means you'll need a staffed call center to answer the customer's questions about your bottle of water. Wow! All those materials, boxes, people, machines, buildings, energy, fuel, and vehicles, they cost money. Those things weren't free, and they probably weren't used efficiently, and it's likely that several bottles didn't survive the journey to the consumer. Oh, and by the way, the employees at the water company, you know, the ones that work in finance, accounting, marketing, human resources, and IT, they want a paycheck too. So through that simple example of a super simple product, we're beginning to see that companies face challenges when they buy things, make things, move things, sell things, and service things, which includes repair and maintenance. Oh, and let's not forget, companies need to do all these things using sustainable materials, energy, and methods. Guess whose job it is to make sure that all these things happen flawlessly, with minimal effort, and of course, at minimal cost. You guessed it, supply chain managers. The supply chain manager needs to be able to do all of these things. They need to give the customer the product they want, when they want it, as often as they want it, for a reasonable price, while still managing to make a profit. This requires world-class skills and knowledge in the study of supply chain management. There's that scary term again, supply chain management. Let me try to make it friendlier by shuffling around the words. There you go. The management of the chain of supply. For some reason, that just seems a whole lot easier to understand, doesn't it? But it also helps us understand the complex nature of supply chain management. I mean, the management of the chain of supplies. Now let's think of other products and what their supply chains might encompass. Hamburgers, sweaters, coffee, tables, cars, and airplanes. Now I know many of you are saying, but I live in a service economy. I won't be manufacturing anything. Wrong again. As of 2008, the U.S. was still the number one exporter of manufactured goods. Okay, maybe not for long. So let's talk about service economy supply chains. Let's think of something you're probably familiar with, the hotel industry. What do hotels manufacture? Lodging experiences, dining experiences, spa experiences, which all together make up vacation and conference experiences. In order to do all these things effectively and efficiently, what's required? Hotels need to buy things like beds, furniture, televisions, cable, food, soaps, towels. They also make things, or in this case, manufacture services like housekeeping, meals, massages, and special events. Hotels also move things like transporting clean towels and food to and from the rooms, as well as transporting guests and their luggage to and from the airport. They even sell things. 
like in-room movies, internet services, and tickets to events. And finally, they also provide services such as making reservations, organizing events, making wake-up calls, and even cleaning and pressing clothes. Once again, we see that the fundamental skills learned in supply chain management can be used to manufacture service experiences as much as they aid in manufacturing products. Well, I hope that this has given you an idea of what supply chain management is all about. You see, this is the reason why little kids all around the world want to be supply chain managers. They want to take part in manufacturing the best products and services on earth. So again, welcome to supply chain management, where all of your childhood supply chain dreams are about to come true. Okay, let's move on. Here's a exhibit of a Gantt chart. So definition time. What is a Gantt chart? All right. Let me think, let me let you think about that for a moment. Okay, so now that you got a chance to think about it, a Gantt chart are bar graphs plotted on a timeline that show a relationship between the scheduled and actual production. Okay. Let me say that one more time. A Gantt charts are bar graphs that have plotted on a timeline that show a relationship between the scheduled and actual production. All right. And this is a CPM network for building a house. What are the phases? Okay. Section five, the question asks, how do operation managers schedule and control production? These are some of the concept checks to review while reading this section in chapter 10. And section six, these are some concept checks. Now, what exactly is lean manufacturing? I think this video gives an excellent uh, idea of what that is. For today's lean tip, we have an amazing gift for you. It's a clip from our introduction to lean manufacturing mini course, which is available on our website at leansmarts.com. In this clip, you're going to see the methods of lean production, specifically how to convert batch production into one piece flow and the amazing results you can get when you do that, well over 50% a lot of the time. So in this video, I'm gonna have two of our finest employees here at Lean Smarts show you how to transform batch production into one piece flow. I have to say it's one of the best demonstrations I've ever seen of this concept on the internet. So get ready, it's pretty great. I wanna finish up and let the clip play and I'll let you see what it's all about. Okay, this is our manufacturing site. As you can see, I got some extra help on this video. Here's employee one on the right and employee two on the left. We're very accepting of people who are different than us at Lean Smarts, but somehow these guys ended up being really similar. In any case, the products that our employees are here today to make is paper airplanes. I'm going to let them start here in just a moment. And what I want you to do is to pay close attention to their process. Look for the waste and look for value and ask yourself if there's a better way to make the production flow. And I'm actually going to speed it up while they work to save us some time. Here we go. Okay, employee one is starting with the folds. She's doing all five of one fold before moving on to the second fold and doing five of those. And you can see that he's doing a batch of five. Now, employee two just got the batch of five and he's getting started as quickly as he can. I 
again he's doing all five folds of one type and then doing all five folds of the second type until he gets done. All right, they did a great job. Or what I mean is the process certainly does need some improvement, but even if it sucks, these guys worked pretty well. Remember that lean isn't about working our people to the bone. It's about being smarter about the process of our work. Okay, did you pay close attention? Were you looking for waste? Let's talk about a few of them. The first one that you may have seen is all the motion. I was picking up and putting down papers over and over and over because I was doing all the folds one at a time before moving on to the second fold and doing five more. Another waste that you may have seen was waiting or maybe you thought boredom. There were a few times you may have caught a yawn among our employees here. Who can blame them though? The process kind of sucks and I would be bored too if I were them. Another waste you may have seen was transportation. When department one was all done, they transported it to department two. Another waste was inventory. Now imagine if these were full scale airplanes. We'd have to have space to stage five airplanes all at the same time. Inventory is wasteful. It requires space, more overhead and utilities. It stretches everything out, so it takes more time to find what you need. Maybe that wasn't so apparent in this example, but the concept of inventory still applies. All of these wastes can be understood from the facts that by doing batch production, it's actually overproduction. Now, I may have a customer who's buying five airplanes, but the fact of the matter is that Department 1 was building five airplanes at a time, even though Department 2 can't handle five airplanes at a time. They can do one at a time, but not five. That's overproduction. We're manufacturing things in a greater quantity than is needed by the next customer, even an internal customer, or earlier than is needed. And that overproduction results in a multiplication of all these other wastes. Now we're going to take it one more step. Not only are we eliminating the waste of motion within each department, but now let's make it flow between departments. We're going to flow each airplane into department two as soon as it's done in department one. That's going to look like this. We're going to flow through the entire value stream in one piece flow fashion. Let's go back to our manufacturing process and now see what they can do. seconds. Now doing one piece flow through both departments, we have dramatically reduced it to one minute and 47 seconds. That's a 64% improvement. I promised you that Lean could do 50% or better, and we've done it right here in this example. And I know that it's a simpler example, but it's a concept that works. It works here, and it works in a lot of manufacturing places. Hey, well, I hope you enjoyed that clip from our mini series. Again, the Introduction to Lean Manufacturing mini series is available on our website at leansmarts.com. There's five videos that are delivered one a day for five days, and it covers all the basics. If you're new to Lean and want to know more about it, this is an incredible opportunity for you. I think there's close to an hour and a half of footage, and we'll talk about an introduction to lean and the history, where it came from, and we'll talk about the methods of lean. And you'll see this video again in more detail as we dig into it. And also the tools. We'll talk about the 10 top tools or 10 most common tools in lean manufacturing from the seven ways of lean to 5S to leveling production to all kinds of things. 
and the culture of lean, how to actually create a lean culture, and how to implement everything that you learn. So it's truly a great overview of lean, especially if you're new to it. I highly recommend it. There's some comedy, kind of like what you've seen in this video. It's a good experience. So check out our website at leansmarts.com. You can sign up for free there and experience that over the next five days. Hope you have a great day. For more lean tips and sound advice for your lean journey, visit us at leansmarts.com. Okay. Um, when you click on your PowerPoint and press the right click button, you could copy or the share button. You could copy here. Okay. Copy the link. Right. And then you could press it in, into an, uh, a web browser. Okay. And these are some questions to consider when you review the video again. And then we get into section seven, what role do technology and automation play in manufacturing and service industry operations? These are some questions to consider when reviewing section seven in chapter 10. And this is a video about how robotics are used to repair and surgery. So let's take a look at this video. When I sit down at the console, I get into the zone. I'm one with the patient almost. It's like a dance. It, it's, so, it's so precise. You know that the robot can augment and amplify my natural abilities. It's an incredible feeling to be a robotic surgeon. Robotic surgery is a very complex laparoscopic surgery. The best way to describe that is there's a computer in between the physician and the patient. The care we're providing, the hernia techniques we are performing here is like no other. It immerses them inside the body. The high definition in three dimension, they can see structures and vessels and nerves that you can't see with the naked eye. Robotics has allowed our physicians to offer our patients a, a better chance of leaving the hospital faster, less pain, less blood loss, quicker recovery. They get back to work faster. They get back to their family faster. Carol is the perfect example of a patient who benefited from robotic surgery. On my right side of my stomach, there's it was like a lump. It was probably the worst pain I've ever had in my entire life. I told my husband, if it doesn't go away by the morning, we we're going to have to call an ambulance or something. It took everything I had just to get through the basics of the day. Dr. Jane Barner from Santa Clara referred me to Dr. Sturkarts in Mountain View. And he was honest enough to say, I don't think I can do this robotically, Carol. And here's a doctor that can do this without having to do an extensive incision. She had a very large incisional hernia. In most places, this hernia would have been fixed open. I was able to offer her robotic surgery through three little incisions. I wasn't afraid at all. I was pretty calm. I trusted that he knew what he was doing after five hour surgery. It was great. I went home the next day, no pain. I didn't have to take any drugs or anything. She was able to return to normal activities very quickly. That is the power of robotics. It takes more than just having a robot to have an amazing robotics program to get good outcomes. It really takes the right surgeon and the right team. We've been doing incredible things that Intuitive has recognized. We have been designated a case observation mentor epicenter by Intuitive Surgery. The manufacturer of the Da Vinci robots. What that means is Physicians from around the country come to our facility to learn the latest techniques in repairing complex hernias. It's been just an incredible journey. Technology is going to help us get patient outcomes that we never thought would be possible. Robotic surgery was the way to go. That made all the difference in the world. That's what robotic surgery was all about. Taking the human hand to the next level. Okay. And there's another video 
about the robot and AI revolution, you might want to check it out. I'm not going to play it here. Right click and copy the video URL. And there's some other ones, um, a trailer for Better Than Us. It's a Netflix video. You may want to check this out. And some questions to consider on how technology and AI is important in the manufacture and service industry, right? Some of the cons, you know, would be the loss of human labor, right? There's always pros and cons. Tell me what your thoughts are on how your business could create jobs and balance out the technology and AI and human labor. Right. And here are some trends in operations management. Uh, let's take a look at this video by right clicking this. Copy the video URL. What I'll do is I'll post some of these videos on the announcements and review this. And these are some questions to consider when you're looking at trends in production and operations management. Technology has certainly helped along the production and operations management field. Some concept checks that I want you to take a look at. And that is chapter 10. Now, remember, review the chapter outlines, review the PowerPoints, and read the textbooks. You did have the links to the textbook online. And um, let me know if you have any questions. Send me an email, and I'll, put, put, I'll send you some of these videos uh, that you can see on your own again. Thank you for your time. And keep in communication with me and your fellow classmates. And come to my office hours when you're able to. Thank you.